Okay, so we're getting ready now. Pat is our presenter tonight, or I should say our workshop leader. And he is going to uh, put us through our paces on how and why we want to use metaphors, mastering metaphors. So Pat, go ahead. Okay, everyone. Um, you know, I was did a run through on this earlier today, and I was thinking about, you know, what I'd miss. And one of the things I missed was at the beginning, which was to sort of say, well, here's what I, I hope you can get out of um, this presentation and sort of discussion about metaphors, which is I hope you get out of it kind of A, an enthusiasm for uh, using more metaphors in your writing, and then B, some confidence that, um, that you can do it and kind of maybe know how to do it pretty well. So I haven't done a presentation in a few months since I retired. So we'll see how well this goes. Okay. So what is a metaphor? Um, a metaphor is broadly speaking, a figure of speech that describes something in a way that isn't literally true. Usually uses a comparison or some kind of symbolism or an extended kind of description to actually describe or emphasize something. Um, metaphors have been in the world of writing for a long time, so, so that Aristotle even uh, wrote the act of giving a name to a thing that belongs to something else. I was really surprised that Aristotle knew English, but um, so far that seems to be the case. So, um, so what we don't sometimes realize about metaphors is how common they are. We use metaphors and similes um, in our daily speech. Some are very common cliches and sayings, like he broke my heart can't break a heart, but it's a, so it's a metaphor. He ate like a pig. I'm just killing time. I'm dog tired. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Um, my eyes were glued to the screen. Joe is normally an early bird. She's a late bloomer. So then what is a simile? Well, similes are essentially metaphors that use like or as to make the comparison. Um, certainly a very well-known one, life is like a box of chocolates. Um, that one, of course, had an extended kind of description of the metaphor as the movie progressed. Uh, there are some picky critics who will argue that uh, similes are not as strong as more um, evolved metaphors, but I kind of think that's hogwash, but I think hogwash is a simile, um, is a metaphor too. So um, here I want to get other people's thoughts as well. So why use metaphors in your writing? Well, they add depth to a description of the person, the setting, the emotion. And, um, they also can intensify an, an action or emotion. They typically will challenge and expand the reader's perception of what you're saying. And I think truthfully, metaphors are among the greatest delights of writing and being a reader. So anyone else um, want to contribute why they think we would, someone would use a metaphor? Is there anything I'm missing here? I've got, variety. I, variety is good. Right, Johnny. Oh, I was just gonna say that one of the things that metaphor does is by linking two things that aren't the same thing, you have made a connection. So if, uh, when you say she's like, she's a late bloomer, you're comparing her to a flower. And all of the connections via, you know, symbolic or linguistic connections, or, or should we say the baggage of a flower is now brought in and placed on, on the woman it's speaking about. So all of that extra meaning and description is actually um, in almost uh, encapsulated in the metaphor. So all right, you're, you're, borrowing, like, you're borrowing attributes and meanings for the yes. thing used in the metaphor to describe something that, that isn't literally correct. Any, any other thoughts about what somebody likes about metaphors? Yeah, it, it makes you see Charlene? It, it oh, makes sorry. you see things in a different way. By by using a different comparison, you 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 see something in a new way or you think about something in a new way because of the way it compares it or describes it. JC, I think you were going to say something or someone else. Uh, yeah, that was me. Basically, I was about to say that metaphors can take something that an audience member or reader might not be initially familiar with, like, say, the futuristic version of the internet or some far off alien species, and directly compares it to something that the audience is familiar with. Therefore, 
connecting them to something that is far off and far out of their experience. Good. Ra Rachel, you Rachel, you teach high school um, students in writing. Do you ever discuss what metaphors are? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> You know, the thing that I like about metaphors the most is I think that you're writing your story is really more engaging to a reader if they can picture it going on in their head. And um, if I just say he was skinny, there's just a vague thing. But if I say he was so skinny, he had to run around in the shower to get wet then you have a picture in your head and it feels like a movie's playing. And that's why I think a metaphor is really good is because of the imagery. Because we don't get enough imagery when we read, we want it, we want the picture playing like a film. That also helps us uh, remember it better too. Good. Okay, now you'll notice at the bottom, I said an entire poem can be a metaphor. So we have some real poets on this call, Charlene and Talissa. Have, can you think of a poem that you've written or one that you particularly like where the whole poem is essentially a metaphor? There are so many. <laughs> yeah, so I think it did, most of them? Most of but, them, yeah. In, in a way, you're right. I mean, it's often the case is that a, a, an entire poem is, is sort of an extended metaphor. I one thought that, it was. One ahead. that I was one of my favorite poems of all time and studying it, and I think most people are familiar is the Raven. That is, even it's a long poem, but the entire thing is a metaphor. Or what? Oh, there are several different levels about his life and how he lives and what the Raven represents and, and the word spoken of nevermore of the meaning that that has in depth to it. It just ties in a lot of other aspects through all of that in telling the story that you have the one person sitting in his room but there it goes well beyond into the greater world. Okay. So I said, can a story be an entire metaphor and probably can more likely to be a short story or even a flash fiction type story um, that rather than a novel, but I suppose it could be a novel. So let's move on. So um, why did they that not work? A, they usually call that an allegory. True, thank you. See, there's the teacher came out. <laughs> Okay, I'm having trouble. It didn't advance the page. There we go. There okay, we go. so um, these are actually kind of my definitions of metaphors because I wanted to just kind of play, give you a chance to kind of play around with them. So I called these the first group kind of mixed or scramble metaphors, which can be useful for humor. Um, I write a fair amount of humor and I find them metaphors are fun. So this one was one that if you, the first one, I ain't nothing but hound dog tired is actually one where you're kind of mixing uh, two different well-known cliches or metaphors into a single one. The second one, I think, is a little more fun. Joe was up like a robin, but dead tired. The worms were safe. <laughs> um, so you can see that that's just a case of where you're kind of mixing the metaphors and scrambling them up a, a bit. So let's take a look at Sandra, the late bloomer. This is what I called an expanded metaphor. Sandra was a late bloomer. She matured in the most beautiful of the daughters, but wilted under the heat of men's stares. So here you've kind of let that late bloomer be expanded to kind of give you a more pre, more interesting kind of explanation. Um, this next one confused my wife. It was kind of an implied metaphor. He ate so much his razorback started showing. Okay, who has trouble getting that? Or who would like me to explain that one? Um, a razorback. Well, I know. I know Razorback is a type of pig. Right. I don't think it's a well-known enough thing. No. Like, I think it would have been better if he said he ate so much his boar was starting to show. His what? His boar, B-O-A-R, like a wild boar. Fair yeah. enough, fair enough. I was, um, that's why I call this one an implied one because it was, it was one step removed um, to make you work a little bit. Okay, why is my screen complaining about changing screens? Okay, so this group I called um, emotive metaphors, and I use some well-known ones here as well as some other writers. Um, that soft wet light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Um, that's more 
conveying an emotional feeling in just the use of the one word son in the way the metaphor was structured. The next one, of course, is painful. The parents looked upon Matilda as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Um, Beyonce, remember those walls I built? Anybody want to sing this one? I'm not going to. Remember those walls I built? Well, baby, they're tumbling down and they didn't even put up a fight. They didn't even make a sound. Um, the wall as a barrier is a very common kind of concept, but here it's given a lot more kind of emotive kind of feeling in the song. Um, the next one had a couple of words that I thought really drove home. The, the metaphor was driven home by the word choice. I don't like that Andrew McDade's parents storm in whenever report cards arrive to grade grub for their kid. Which book was that from? Um, I'd have to go look it up. It was it's on my bookshelf. It's the only time I've ever read a Harlan Coben, so it was the first one. Uh, this next group, I, I couldn't think of a generic way to describe them, so I just called them challenging metaphors because it, it, they're not ones that the meaning is apparent necessarily at the beginning, or at least they create a kind of challenge for you to think about them. The first one is, my thoughts are stars I cannot fathom into constellations. Um, this next one, wishes are thorns, he told himself sharply. They do no good, just stick our skin and hurt us. Um, I rather like that one. Cahill Gabran, all our words are but crumbs that fall down from the feast of the mind. Um, powerful, kind of challenging. And then finally from the Old Testament, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Some other ones, um, my poor father, I can see him blundering through the patio furniture and Lone Ranger pup tents, dragging his sleeping bag like the corpse of his dead hope. Okay, well, not exactly cheery, happens to be my favorite author, one of my favorite books, but wasn't cheery. Pirandello, the Italian best known for his plays, life is little more than a loan shark. It exacts a very high rate of interest for the few pleasures it concedes. And Ashley Brilliant, a uh, uh, humorous writer, my wife, my life has a superb cast, but I can't figure out the plot. Um, In there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we move pretty fast, but I think I missed a slide. If you don't mind me taking a moment to go back. Uh, yes, I missed these descriptive metaphors, and it was just because I was missing um, earlier, and then we'll catch up. The sun was a toddler insistently refusing to go to bed. It was past 8.30 and still light. Um, the swimming pools steam like sleeping geysers. The wind blows away the storm until the moon swims high, moored like a kite and darting against the fleeing shreds and ragtags of clouds. And um, picked up Dave Bear, one of Dave Barry's novels. Eddie had pulled the pelvic region of his pantyhose over his face so that both legs were hanging down his back, making him look like a large frightened rabbit. Um, that was a good example, I think, what Rachel was talking about, if someone else was about how you can paint the whole picture by you know, this kind of extended metaphor. You can actually see this guy pulling these around and the, 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 the ends of the pantyhose pulled over um, his head. He was a, a criminal trying to rob a bar, I think, at that point. Um, Andrew shut up. His nose was bleeding and he was obviously terrified. To Monica, he looked about as missing as Kermit the Frog. Um, a great image to make sure nobody, to describe something that doesn't look very terrifying. Okay, so here I am not looking at the, at the chat, but I would invite people, since we were ch chirping in real nicely anyway, to just share something that's one of your favorites, maybe tell a little bit why. Who'd like to go first? If you've got one. All right, this one isn't from a book. Who here has seen James Cameron's Avatar? All right. Probably everybody but me, JC. All right, well, basically one of the 
behind the scenes thing was James Cameron describing Pandora. And he basically gave it a brief single sentence metaphor description. The Garden of Eden with teeth. Basically, it looks like paradise, but everything in there might just be trying to eat you. That's great. I've got one I came across today. I can't say it's my favorite, but I, uh, it's not bad. I've been reading uh, David Badlachi's latest book, Dreamtown, or at least this new in paperback. He's describing a banker. He says, Archer wasn't sure whether the man's hair was actually his or was simply on loan from the bank at a competitive interest rate. I thought that was <laughs> kind of original anyhow and rather humorous, but. Okay, this is I shared one from my work in progress in the chat, kind of proud of it, it's extended. It actually pays off later too, I'll give you the last piece. Um, nothing in the key logs disproved the murder-suicide. In the detective world of motive, means, and opportunity, opportunity was sitting on Sange's couch in its underwear, asking where the pay channels were. Meanwhile, means is knocking at the door, but I couldn't let her in yet. I need, a I need a check of references and get first and last at least. Cleaning deposit goes without saying. Even so, should they crash the house with a six pack of PBR and a bag of Lay's, later to pass out in the tub, vomit on their shoes, that ever elusive third triumvirate member motive hadn't even RSVP'd. The party may have begun, but had not yet started. <laughs> that is definitely an extended metaphor. Good. And uh, okay, yeah. the grizzled detective voice really sold it. <laughs> you got to know, Tony. <laughs> That's uh, I like that. I, I ran into that and I thought, oh, I said, I got. I guess I gotta show that to Pat. Good. All the world's a stage, am I right? That's true. Some of us are actors and some of us are just handling the lights. Yep. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah. Okay. So um, Johnny shared some, uh, his personal one. And I thought if we're gonna spend a little bit of time creating uh, metaphors in the next few minutes, I should at least point out um, a little bit about my own. So I wanted to, before I, well, let me, let me just do these and then I'll talk a little bit about my, my process for uh, working on metaphors. Um, the first one, the constant rain seemed purposeful and neglectful, like it knew the river would reach its banks and didn't care. Um, the hood of the car was Bunsen burner hot. Um, a tapestry of memories that will fade and unravel as the threads of my aging brain weaken, loosen, and break. Um, the next three are from um, a road trip novel that I wrote involving three men that are turning 50. Testosterone is to bleeding as gravity is to falling, cause and effect. Um, driving a Hummer is a man's way to play army after his waist and wallet have fattened. Alcohol is the WG-40 of the male brain. It loosens the tongue, unhinges inhibitions, and speeds the release of idiocy. Um, so those were some of the ones that um, I pulled in from my own writing. Um, we're going to take a moment and we're going to practice some, take five minutes or so and practice some metaphors. But before we did, I thought I would, I think you guys can see this, it doesn't really matter. This is my, my notebook that I do a lot of my writing and stuff in. And in this particular case, I started off with a list of words up above that I wanted to practice writing metaphors for, words or concepts. So in this case, it was largely working on this novel that was um, about these four guys all turning 50. And so it was a range of different kinds of words that, that I started, I wanted to work on. Blood, um, horny, 
Um, I think I use set. Uh, uh, pissed is one that I was looking for. And the pissed one was one that I, I have as an example because I first wrote down by hand the first idea that came to my mind, which was sort of something simple, like he was pissed like, a, a, like an angry rattlesnake about to strike. And I was like, mm, I could do better than that. And then that evolved into um, he was pissed like a rattlesnake with a two foot rattle you know, just kind of giving you that sense. And I was like, eh, maybe not quite right. Um, he was pissed off and it was as, as obvious, and it was as, it was obvious from the narrowing of his suddenly snake-like eyes. A little bit better. So the, the, the point I was trying to get at here is that you're not necessarily going to get what you're looking for on the first attempt as you're trying to put together a, um, a metaphor. And so then I was thinking about, well, let me tell you a little bit about how I did it. And then I was also thinking about how you can use it. I was not sure that I were, was going to use any of these metaphors in the, in the book. Um, but I, I was able to entertain myself and actually write the metaphors while I was um, sitting at the sofa, the book at my thing in front of me, I could have been a laptop. In this case, it was a notebook. And I just kind of kept playing around with them for um, an hour or two. And then I did it again a couple of other times. And you can really kind of tap into some creativity when you don't have a specific paragraph or chapter in front of you and you're just playing around with it. Now, in this case, I was pretty sure some of these would find their way into the book. So this actually kind of became a reference which I would then later tap, turn to when I was actually writing scenes um, in the novel. And then finally, this is a very um, interesting thing to do when you're going back on a, a second writing, second review or a third review of something that you've written, whether it's a short story or a novel. And as you're reading your, your own stuff and you take a, a bit of time to do it, not all of us are like Johnny. We're not going to have these extended long metaphors that just pour out of our brains on the first effort. And so I would find myself going back and then pulling in some of these metaphors that I had written or thinking of some new ones as I was going back through the story and wanted to kind of um, add some color, some additional emotion, some humor, uh, whatever those, whatever it might be that I was working on. So that's how um, I've been able to use metaphors in um, my writing. Sometimes they come immediately as I'm writing, and other times they're um, a second time around, and sometimes they're just things that I'm developing independently entirely. So it's time to practice. I hope you all have a computer or a piece of paper in front of you. I want you to pick a topic or two from this list or any topic that you want. And for the next five minutes, work on, quite frankly, multiple uh, metaphors for any one or two or three of these that you that interest you. If you get stuck on one and it doesn't work, um, you know, shift to another one. And then we'll come back in five minutes and look for volunteers. We'll post some of them if you want right away in the chat. Uh, but I'm hoping we'll also have some people speak up and volunteer the ones they have. Okay, the clock has started. Start five minute timer.
the camera now picking up my beautiful image here. I'm not quite sure why. Hmm. Okay. Okay, everyone, five minutes is up. Um, I am totally open to people just speaking up and sharing something they've written. And as I said, if you've got a moment, you can type them into the into the chat. I've got something. JC. This is a little thing. Like the original idea was a novel I'm planning on working on that takes some inspiration from Waterworld. You can see it when you read it. I have lost audio. No, oh, yeah. he just. Oh, was he I supposed to read it aloud? Yes. Oh, well, my my apologies. <clears throat> Poking above the endless waves of the ocean were the shattered skyline of buildings. The remnants of the city were left scattered and broken like the bones of a great beast, picked clean by generations of scavengers thieves and grave robbers. The only sign of life left in the crumbling ruins were the various kelp-like vines and corals that wound their way around the abandoned wreck, the last scavengers clinging to the corpse of a long dead civilization. Okay, nice extended one. Um, what do you guys think about- Yeah, I'm really proud of that one. Yeah, what did, what are the other people? Yeah, I think you should. But um, what did anybody else pick up from that metaphor? What 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 were your reactions to it? The JC probably writes lots of fantasy. <laughs> World building going on here. Well, I, I thought JC that your um, that your similes. Uh, evoked really nice imagery. Oh, thank you. It gives depth to a backstory that there's more that's been going on for a long time. I think time is definitely captured in that. Um, I think there's also a um, a tone, an emotional tone, if you want to call it that, more than just emotional, and that's with words like scavengers, thieves, and grave robbers. Um, clearly sets a tone that you're supposed to pick up on, I would say. Well, I am proud of the melancholic thing, especially the corpse of a long dead civilization. I really, it just kind of came to me. Well, we've got a few now showing up in chat. Johnny, why don't you do yours next since you were in order? Um, uh, see, I, what do I put it? Music like a Hell's Angels mugging. Music more laxative than relaxing. <laughs> Cotton candy harmony, sickly sweet and ethereal, and ethereal, made him think of, made him see circuses. And then I have uh, the music like a hairball mixtape. I'm not quite sure what a hairball mixtape would be, but okay. <laughs> I, imagine you had a lot of hairball sounds. I made a mixtape of that. I have a cat. I know what that sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we know that sound. Yeah. <laughs> So a mixtape of various choking sounds. Okay, that's, that's it. Image. Rachel, you want to do yours? Oh, I just did it. that the boredom one struck my imagination. Boredom cushioned in brain clouds, lounged languidly in the silence of her empty imagination. Okay, so why did you pick words like lounge languid languidly? I liked it because it had alliteration. <laughs> boredom cushioned. <laughs> but you know. I don't think um, I don't think boredom is a bad thing because boredom is what creates something inside of an em empty imagination. And when your mind is just always going, you actually don't have any imagination. So you have to have boredom for imagination. So I just like the lounging languidly. 
Yeah, I would, well, I would, the reason I was asking was because I think there's an interesting contrast with JCs here in the choice of words and the imagery conveyed. You know, that's definitely not this kind of intense, um, almost anxiety causing kind of words that were in the other one. This one kind of pulls you into the the mood of of boredom or or certainly being languid. Uh, the words themselves are are kind of languid. Dan, you want to go next? Sure. Tom passed through the gate to look out over the public swimming pool. Human hippopotami floated on the water and lounged around the edges. It was clear that Devin considered himself the beach master. <laughs> oh. Good, good. And so what were you trying to, um, when you use human hippopotami, what were you trying to convey here? It's to me, it very much shows kind of a looking out in this area of what the people look like in comparison to a pot of hippopotamuses or hippopotami in a river or on the beach. So one other thing that's um, kind of clear from this one and somewhat true of, of Johnny's, it's actually judgmental too. So yes. um, a... Um, the human hippopotami is is setting the tone that the narrator, whoever is this, the point of view, is actually being very judgmental. And then, of course, it ends with the last sentence, Devin considered himself the beach master, kind of reinforces that character trait of Devin, that he's uh, judgmental at this point. Logan, you want to go next? Sure. She never felt unwelcome, but at the same time, she felt pressed into her spot a little askew and awkward. And what were you trying to achieve here? I was trying to drop the image of a jigsaw puzzle, trying to put in a piece that doesn't belong. Did you consider using the jigsaw as part of the metaphor? Because we all know what those are like. <laughs> I, yeah, I was wondering, I, I was dancing to myself whether or not I should. Did it come across immediately for any of you when you read it? Pas moi, not me. Fair enough. <laughs> well, it's just me. I It didn't really hit me that it was a jigsaw, but I think you could say a lot more if it made the direct comparison with a, like a jigsaw puzzle piece or something of that nature, or even just a puzzle piece. <clears throat> Melody, let's do yours. Um, I wrote, the tune carried them along, ebbing and flowing in the lyrical river. Okay, what were you trying to achieve there? Um, I, I had in my head just like how a song, you know, like the classic, almost like classical piece, you just kind of wilting along. Okay, so, but the, the other thing that I like about this one is it, it's unlike the um, hairball symphony that Johnny was writing about. <laughs> This one is much more gives you a sense of a lyrical kind of tune. The fact that you use the word lyrical means that you we are going to tend to hear something that's melodic and, and probably pleasant. <laughs> um, well, we're just doing them in order. Logan, you want to do your next one? Sure. His heart thrummed out a symphony of rage, cascading ever louder and heavier until at last it crescendoed. Cool. What were you trying to get out th get there? Uh, I think just this sensation of a growing emotion, but tying it to music so you can almost feel pulse pulsing through his body. Good. Um, now, you it's it's about rage. So um, was it at this point you pictured it as building or that it was just at its peak um, here? I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think I'm picturing building to a peak in this, but I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sorry, Talissa didn't get to share with us. She's disappeared. Talissa is quite the poet. She's been publishing a lot and winning awards. Um, Charlene? Yeah, I am not going to try and read mine. You want me to read Somebody it? Somebody else can. Sure, go ahead. Sure. The roses grew across the front of the house, twisting and preening to see and be seen, all the while digging their razor-sharp thorns into the wood, leaving a hundred unseen scars. 
pansies grew in a chorus line of color, leaves outstretched, awaiting sun's adulation. So these are these are wonderful. Where are they from? Were they from something you've written before, or this just came? No, it's just what came to me in those five minutes. So what were you? What with the first one, the roses one? I mean, I realize it's a whole garden scene here now taking shape, but um, um it it came from a a cozy mystery I'm listening to, and uh, one of like four poems I was working on last night. I was working on a a poem about spring, and just the two kind of combined because the, the cozy mystery is about someone in a, who runs a cottage garden. So flowers were in my head. Gotcha. Um, this is kind of um, anthropomorphizing the, the, the roses, giving them almost more human-like characteristics. Do you do that? Do you like to do that in kind of your poetry or other writing? Sometimes. It's, it's, um, it's quite lovely. The grew in a chorus line was the one I really particularly liked in the pansies. I, I, grow a fair number of flowers and I can picture those pansies. And I've also gotten unbelievable rose thorns that are feel like they're two inches long. Rachel. Yeah. No, um, Charlene's just uh, made me want to put one that I wrote up there because it, I have roses on the brain too right now, Charlene. <laughs> they're cool. in a different mode. Go ahead and read it. Oh, um, okay, sorry. Her petal soft lips bloomed around a thorn spiked tongue. Okay. That's nice. <laughs> okay. You, that... were you were asking for friendship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what were you trying to draw in this contrast between petal soft lips and a thorn spiked tongue? What were you trying to bring See, out? We, well, I guess I had roses on the brain, just like Charlene did. So, and I think um, that it just made me think of people. And, you know, it, often when you compare people to other things, you it gives you a good image of what that person is like. Okay. Any others? The people that either want to write them or speaking? Anna, Matt, what'd you do? Matt, I got one. Up. Oh, go ahead. Okay, Bob. Yeah. I was this saying, I, I chose fear. Fear lurks in the deepest corners of our minds, always lurking just out of sight, spinning lies, waiting, waiting. A velociraptor clawing deeper, deeper into the pathways of our hearts. And what were you trying to, to, to build or convey with that metaphor? Well, this uh, just to kind of describe what fear can do to us and how it kind of seeps into our minds and hearts, and it's a lie basically. Okay. Did it work? Uh, Maybe it did. No, no, I, I just want to get your impression of what you're trying to do. Um, Anna, did you come up with one? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't mind me asking, I hope. We, oh, no. <laughs> some of us know how wonderful a writer in it is so I was just oh. thinking maybe she was being shy. Stop so. it, <laughs> uh, Dan. We okay. Uh, the lone viola counterpointed with a subtle cooing against the others, rushing wind through the rafters. Hmm. The others is puzzling me here. The other instruments, or in this case, or in this case, I was looking kind of like the rest of the sounds going on. Okay. So it's the single point of a calming, a calming sound within the storm. Cool. Um, I don't call on people normally, but so I just thought I would. I'm being too professorial here. Um, anyone else want to add or comment on the ones you've heard, or does anybody have any kind of worry that this is um, scary or? feel is somehow intimidating. Well, I was just, oh, go ahead. No, I was, I was just gonna comment that metaphors are always an opportunity. Whenever it's, it's a way to make people, um, to, to make things memorable, to compare, but um, you'll often find yourself just go, grabbing for low hanging fruit. So Pat, your earlier example of, um, making several different runs at the same metaphor is a great idea. 
um, because you seldom have the best one on your first go. So write down, you know, come up with a bunch of them and seeing which one works best also and knowing which one works best in the context of your story. Would, would, a, would, a, would, an, would an agricultural metaphor be more appropriate than a mechanical one, for example? Those kind of things can work with thematic. But so metaphors are always just among the most powerful tool in any writer's, um, in any writer's toolkit. So, um, and there's so much fun. Look at these, these are fun. Yeah, they are. I wasn't sure how um, easily they would flow for some people, but I think people have been um, pretty pretty impressive here. I it was flowed like a flowing thing. <laughs> yes, it flowed like a flowing thing, a river of words. Um, so Johnny Johnny's point about um, finding the right metaphor and then playing around with them. The one thing that I didn't emphasize, and I, but I thought we saw some really good examples of this, is where the metaphor has a sound to it, and that often that's the precise choice of words as well as sometimes the cadence that is begins to be a little on the poetic side, or at least where you actually are hearing those words um, as you read it. Now, I'm not a fast reader. I literally, when I find something that I'm reading that I like, I will almost always hear the words. And with metaphors, that's sometimes particularly a joyful kind of experience. But it's also one of those things where they're, they're worth editing and thinking about and, and playing around with um you know as you're as you're writing and um probably w way more fun than you realize if you're not if you're not using metaphors currently um in your writing as i said earlier occasionally they will come to me on the first pass as i'm writing something um i wrote a short story a couple of year and a half ago or so that did well at um, the league contest and it was one where um, it was in first person present tense in a female voice, which was kind of a challenge I gave myself. And um, one of the first things that came to me was I, you know, his his voice rolls over me like the like like I forget what exactly, but his voice rolls over me like the the waves of uh, ocean waves, you know, this warm ocean waves. Yes, and so it was just kind of that came to me the first time through. Um, but usually I'm not that gifted a, a writer. To be able to get them right off, and so they're they're part of the work of writing, and um, but also probably one of those things that's most satisfying when you find one. I mean, you 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 know Johnny's pride in the one this extended one that he wrote about motive. Let me see if I've got it right. Motive uh, means and uh, opportunity. Um, so. Not, I, I'm attempting writing a, a, another mystery myself right now, but there's so anyway. much fun. Okay. Any final comments or questions? Um, this was fun for me. I hope it's um, motivating for you. And oh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. That's good. Yes. Thank well, you. Back to you, Dan, if you want to pick up on anything else. Stop sharing screen. Oh, good idea. We're, and we're back. Then that caller, caller number five wins a new toaster. Okay, thanks, thanks, Pat. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just let everybody know what I'm gonna do with this is we're gonna end the recording here now. And I will post, uh, put this together and post it up on YouTube. And I will put out the link in the Facebook page and I will include it in the next uh, meeting minutes and everything so that everybody has access to it. And if you want to share it out, that's always more than welcome to do so. And Sobi, thanks for putting one up in the chat. I didn't see it earlier when I was going down the line. So no worries. Oh, I didn't see it. Where is Robert? Oh, uh, 